We were in the command center that night, and when we got word that the first wave hit, we were all looking out the window, and you just saw a little stream of water come up Seaview Avenue. Three minutes later, the water was to the divider on Seaview Avenue. Three minutes later, there were two fire trucks racing up Seaview Avenue, chased by a wave that you literally could have surfed on. And within minutes, that wave was up to the ED parking lot. Our neighbors next door had a one-family house. They had four children, and at that point, we saw electricity in the water. So my husband, he told him to break the skylight and go up onto the roof. So that night, you know, I stayed by the window all night and talked to them and they were singing and praying and so was I that that they would be okay. The water made its way all the way here to the curb of the hospital. On the floor, I heard stories of doctors that were coming from across the street where the apartment buildings are, making their way across the street to so that they can be here for patients once the surge of water was coming. I think that they wanted to get into the building before they were unable to. It was just really scary. I remember the wind blowing really hard. You could hear it on the windows from inside the hospital. Um, patients were asking to look outside the windows and wanted to look in, outside the windows. It was definitely scary out here. There were a lot of people that had issues that were trying to beat the storm in. So there was a lot of people with minor to semi-minor things before the leading edge of the water. And, and sadly, you do tend to see people that have real issues start to come in during things like this. People with significant mental illness, people that don't really have anywhere to stay, people that aren't sure where they're going to stay, people that don't know if they can make it home. We were getting a bunch of those towards the end and trying to coordinate where those people would go and what we would actually do to make sure that people were safe. We didn't start seeing a lot of the injury or storm related stuff until really towards the end. I think as the storm came through, we realized as we watched the floodwaters come up Seaview Avenue and approach the hospital that we needed to react differently than we initially prepared for. We had received a phone call that all the streets to the hospital were closed. There was no way for a vehicle to get in. Mason Avenue had been flooded in. All of Seaview Avenue had been flooded in for well over an hour at that point. We're less than a mile from the beach and we're surrounded by a couple of things that that caused us problems and a couple of things that probably saved a lot of lives. We have a bunch of bungalow communities on both sides of Staten Island Hospital and all those bungalow communities were wiped out. Those were the people being brought in by the Coast Guard and Good Samaritans. The last way to get back onto our campus it was the back Mason Avenue way and when that one closed they told us that we were essentially cut off. Well about 15 minutes after we were cut off a gentleman in a black Ford F-150 pickup truck somehow pulls up to the ED entrance with his neighbor who was having chest pain and frankly probably saved his life. People were amazed that he had actually made it to the hospital and he drove away. But that gentleman, whoever you are, and if you, read, if you see this and you, and you tell me who you are, uh, I'd love to meet you. One of the things that saved us, and we learned this post Sandy in, in one of our debriefs, South Beach Psychiatric Center is right below us. And what South Beach Psych Center did, it acted as a barrier reef. And basically, it funneled the water to both sides of Staten Island University Hospital. So that, that enabled us to accept patients because the wave was diverted away from us and people did have a, a port of entry into our facility. Now, depending on where you live, it may bring up to six inches of rain, 80 mile per hour wind gusts, 20 to 30 foot high seas, and extreme coastal flooding. It's all during a full moon, too, when tides are even higher. So after the wave crested, or after the water reached the, the, the level of the parking lot, that's not the only place the water came. The water was coming everywhere off the shore of Staten Island. It was, you know, the wave was miles and miles wide. So once the wave hit, and our job was to assess the safety of the ED and make a decision if we thought we would need to evacuate the emergency department at the north site. At that point, there was no place to go but up. So if we needed to evacuate the ED, we were just gonna bring everybody up to the second and third floor to keep them safe. The water was lapping up over the curb. And at that moment, I, was, I said, what are we gonna do? Because probably another 
two feet, if that, and the water would have been into our emergency department. And, you know, again, I, I preface this by saying, you know, Frank Marisano, someone always calm, and, and, he, and I remember him looking at me and saying, I'm scared. So Dr. Rodolik made a mark on the ground with the chalk. If the water goes past this mark, we're gonna to have to evacuate the emergency department. And it was about a foot or so from where the water was. And fortunately, the water never reached that level. In that moment, you know, that vulnerability of the storm, and I, I, I don't know if people, you know, everyone has their own experience, but to really appreciate what, you know, healthcare workers do, because everybody feels that, you know, you just do it. And we do but just to appreciate that vulnerability that we were feeling in that moment, and then to just go in and continue to take care of the patients and, and, and our staff. Managing the two emergency departments was frankly the easiest part of my job for that you know, 48 hour period. The one thing about emergency department personnel, docs, nurses, techs, associates, PCAs, clerks is when the chips are down, they're all in. Practically no street left that makes this point accessible. Um, there are fires burning in the area and for first responders to get there, it's been completely cut off. So as the flood waters went into our employee parking lot and cars were flooded out, how are we going to communicate that to the employees and, and make sure they get home? How are we gonna help them when they were, are without a car? Or who lives across the street from the hospital where the flood waters invaded? And you know, do they need temporary housing? My car was parked at the edge of the parking lot in the uh, emergency department ED, and literally within minutes, the wave was up to the front tires of my car. It's really amazing to look back and to think about that night into the following morning. What we were getting is these terrible phone calls from family members into the folks working, talking about the devastation, right? Talking about people that couldn't get out of their homes, talking about how everything they owned had been washed away. And there were these amazing human beings who worked and didn't leave and did what they needed to do while some portion of their lives had just washed away or some portion of their lives had just been destroyed. People working in the emergency department were dealing with their own personal issues and really s stepped up to their health care obligation and put those aside to take care of the patients that needed us that day. But there were people that I worked with for a straight 36 hours, and I had no idea that one person in particular had lost everything in the world they owned while they were still working their shift. But there were a lot of people that sat there and protected Staten Island only to find out the next day they had nothing to go back to. I was fortunate that I was able to go home, but I have to say many of my colleagues at Staten Island University Hospital did not have that opportunity, and that's the story that really needs to be told. You know, these are our neighbors as well, right? They truly are superheroes. These are people that still had to worry about their own homes, but they were there for the long haul. And for me, those are the people that I still thank to this day. And thankfully, the company was able to help them a little bit, and we were able to set up funds to try to get some of these people back up on their feet. But I can only imagine what it feels like to essentially give of yourself that much, to put yourself at personal risk to be there for other people, only to try to go back home the next day and to realize that your driveway where you park your car is under four feet of water. In the morning, there was a rescue. They wanted to take us. And I told them to take them first because they needed to, to get those children, you know, to safety. I do recall after the storm had hit and, and the surge, uh, my block on Tottenville was spared, but unfortunately, my neighbors just a couple of blocks over were not. When we were rescued, one of our neighbors down the block, they had lost their basement, but their upstairs was okay. So they gave us towels and they gave us clothes to change into. I do think that it was a unique situation that morning where the influx of patients was very large. And it was also accompanied by what I would call uncertainty. There was a lot of discussions about severe casualties in the community and unfortunately they weren't far off. Staten Island was the largest percentage of people lost in the hurricane. Probably the, the hardest thing that I recall was my neighbor came over and was telling us the names of the people that, that lost their lives and 
It was... Sorry. <clears throat> Angela, the little girl that, uh, that lost her life, was one of my youngest best friends. So it was hard for all of us. People were coming to the hospital by modes of transportation I thought I would never see in my lifetime. People were coming up on jet skis. The Coast Guard had uh, rescue baskets behind jet skis, were bringing people in. And I remember that next day, it was surreal. And I think that was the word of the day back then. It was, it was surreal, it was unrecognizable. You know, for lack of better words or analogy, what always stuck at my head was that all of these boats were, were up on Highland Boulevard and, and scattered about and going down onto the South Shore, uh, just going into these neighborhoods that, that were on the shoreline, just with these homes devastated with dirt and mud and, and flooding. We were also displaced from our office. Our office was moved to by Moore High School, so we worked there for quite a while. I came back to work. That was actually, for me, the best thing to happen because I felt safe and normal, you know, working and being with my coworkers and everybody was so supportive.